little bit more. We're more than we're about halfway through, if not a little bit more, but we're going to keep going. So thanks you guys for wrapping things off. We got some more great prizes, but we're going to dive into the next section of trip planning. And kind of if you can uh, plan for your trip, you can really be uh, be ahead of you, being aware of what's going on out there. So, and the first thing that we look at is the Avalanche Center's bulletin. And the Avalanche Center is going to provide us the danger level. So what's the danger rating for the day? They're going to give us regional trends. So is the trend increasing or decreasing? You know, they'll tell us that. They're also going to give us weather forecast and pertinent info. So for example, they might say, um, this afternoon we're expecting a storm to move through with six to eight inches of heavy precip. We expect the danger trend to increase. And so they're going to give us a lot of information out there. Some other things to look at is, you know, online resources and guidebooks and local knowledge. So here at the Wasatch, we're really fortunate. There's a lot of really good um, guidebooks out there. And there's also these uh, ski touring maps. And like I think Paul says, we've got some out here tonight to sell, and that all the money goes to have our center. They also have them at White Pine Touring, Black Diamond, REI, a bunch of ski shops have them. But those touring maps really help you lay out the land. And what else it does, if you are ever caught in an accident, whether it's an avalanche or maybe your friend just dislocates their shoulder, the maps really help you have an idea of the name of the train you're in. So if you had to call for help, we're all in the same terminology with where you're at. So once again, this is what that home page for the Utah Avalanche Center looks at, looks like. And when you click on one of these you know, highlighted areas, and we'll, we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper in that, but what those highlighted areas are, it's the color. And that's the color of the North American Danger Scale. So if you go to any different avalanche site, it's all the same. And now we're finally got on the same page with Europe, Canada, New Zealand. And we're all using these international symbols here. So low, moderate, considerable, high, and extreme. And with that, we have the danger rating, and then we have the travel um, advice. And then we have the likelihood, and then kind of like the destructive potential of avalanche. Now the scale kind of is a little bit tricky to read. So it's, you know, it's low, moderate, civil, right? Well, it's not just linear. So low, the next step isn't just moderate, and so forth, it's not just the next step. It's actually exponentially. So moderate is twice as bad as low, and considerable is twice as bad as moderate. So does that make sense? So it's exponentially each time, kind of like an earthquake, you know how it like, gets worse every time? That's how this avalanche scale works. So and there's some good online tutorials about that. So if we go back to the home page, you can see that it's all highlighted in orange, to, orange for that given day. And if we were to click on the area that, you know, the Wasatch front here, they kind of dive a little bit more deeper into, their, into the website, and they'll kind of give a great synopsis. So for that given day, they use orange, so considerable hazard above 9,000 feet, considerably between 8,900, so at the middle elevation, and then below that, that 8,000 feet is moderate. So they're saying, you know, and then they issued an avalanche watch for that day. And anytime these avalanche watches are out there, it's a huge red flag for me when I'm out in the mountains. So be really heads up. Use this online resource. And all the avalanche centers today are trying to use an international kind of standard with this mountain. So it's really easy to read these days, you guys. So, but people are like, well, how do I know what terrain, like, you know, moderate means or low or things that are really going to do? So what we've done here is we've got the danger rating up top. And we've got this just nice big picture of some mountains that we all want to go ski, right? Who's from Crested View? You know where this is? Oh, yeah, it's on the other side of the town. Um, Axel, Evan, Evan. Oh, Red Lady Bowl? Red Lady, okay. Don't get another prize. Disappointing. <laughs> you didn't learn anything in college, obviously. All right? So let's just take a look at this picture. And if today is a low danger day, so that ah, Crested View Island Center, let's just imagine they put out low hazard. We maybe feel comfortable skiing, snowboarding, snowmobiling in any of that terrain, just following the, what the what the restrictions are. If we bump it to moderate, you know the areas that are highlighted are terrain features we want to be aware of. So this steep convex roll, maybe here, maybe that steeper face out in the distance, and this tight gully or terrain track. Okay. So on a moderate day, maybe you feel comfortable skiing or riding right down the middle of this big big bolt. Notice on a considerable day how much more terrain we've highlighted here. And this is just following that danger scale ratings, okay? So on a considerable danger, we take away a lot of the terrain that we feel comfortable skiing or riding in. And so that's kind of a good, I think this is a good visualization for when, for the hazards out there and what terrain to be in, you guys. And here's a good example of what, you know, high would look like and then just following it. So on a high danger, we wouldn't want to be the one out of that huge avalanche pattern. And we'd be really confined to just the thickest parts of the trees on a ridge line. We wouldn't even want to be in thick trees down below. 
So we're going to move into travel timing. So how we travel. So what do we think about this guy's travel timing? Have you ever seen that there? <laughs> and some of these photos I just love looking at. Them. Have you ever seen like a monster cornice of us? It's a dark one. It's a dark one, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when you think about travel techniques, this is, would be like a good example of maybe not the best place to travel. But instead, like, we really like to stay on bridge lines, away from the hazard as we're traveling uphill. So it may take longer to break trail on this, on this ridge line than it would be going on this big open face. Yeah. On a low day, would that be still a bad place to go? You know, on a low day, for me, in my experience, level, I probably still wouldn't travel there, because if that corner's broke, you know, it's more risk than I'd be willing to take. So I'd probably still practice good travel techniques and stay on the ridge line. But we all kind of have different risk acceptance levels out there. So where would you go with on this side of the... So I would say kind of like right here on this ridge line, and kind of work in between the trees and kind of here. You know, as so we see how the wind probably came this way, loading this slope. So this area is going to be more wind scoured, so it's less likely to have an avalanche or prone to avalanche, while well, this train would be more prone. So I would kind of stay more on this tree ridge line than on this side of the train feature. That would be how I would travel through this train. So travel techniques are ways to further minimize our risk out there. And I'm just going to put these up here. These are some common travel techniques out there. So maintaining visual contact, like there's no reason to charge ahead, like have your iPhone or iPod <laughs> things all plugged in, right? There's no reason, like right back as you scheme, we talked about some some instability signs of shooting cracks and moving. If you're jamming to your reggae music and you're not maintaining visual contact, you're not going to be able to see these warning signs out there. Okay, regrouping in safe zones, right? Staying together. Now, was that a, that snowmobile video that I showed? Were those guys in a safe zone down there? Yes. No, right? And that's really common as I'm out backcountry skiing, and Freddie sees this all the time too, is people just stop right below the big slope and they're like, oh, cool, I'm going to get my camera out and now take photos with my friend, right? But step off to the side, you know, and you can get just as good a picture, but just don't be in the runout zones. Maybe skiing down in shorter pitches if the terrain calls for that. Or maybe if it's a big face, maybe that causes you to ski in long pitches. And so a lot of that just comes with experience and knowing whether to ski in shorter segments or longer segments. But we always want to maintain visual contact with your with your partners out in the back, which not just for avalanche reasons, but also for uh, maybe getting injured. Then the last thing is, is easing into the slope. Now I'm going to talk about this. Easing into the slope is instead of when you get to the top of a feature. It's taking like, the steepest, most radical line first right away. Maybe you ski on the right or left side, maybe you have to take a more conservative line. Get a feel how the snow is before you ski the steepest part. And I think that's a good way out there. A lot of times if you're out, maybe you ski your first one's only 25 degree out, 25 degree train or 28 degree train. Then maybe this, you'll see the snow cracking, but it's not steep enough to avalanche. And maybe then next time you know, hey, maybe I won't move into that 35 degree train. But if you drop right in the steepest terrain without you know, easing the slope, you're kind of asking, asking for it. So you know, get, gather some information before you go right to the base features. So when we're traveling uphill, we like to avoid avalanche terrain. So stay on the ridge lines because you spend most of your time traveling uphill back when you ski, right? Well, I, I do. I'm pretty slow. So. so I like this photo here again. It's kind of cool. You can see back when you ski, as I said, this nice skin track to the side, and then they're just stacking the tracks out this nice ski. So they're, you know, the, where they set their skin track, it's lower angle, and then they're skiing the steeper slope, and they stack from this side out. So easing into the slope, going towards the steeper terrain. So it's kind of a good, good example of that. Or maybe the terrain calls for you to space out. You know, this Mount Rainier, and then you, you know, you want to space out just 100 feet, 100 yards, depending on the terrain feature, so you're not all underneath the big island path at the same time. When you get to the top of the run, and now all of a sudden you want to ski, snowboard, ride down, whatever it is, um, it's important to maintain visual contact. So everybody buckles their boots, you kind of finish sipping on your teeth, finish texting or tweeting or whatever you're doing, right? And then go down. And one of my biggest pet peeves when I'm out skiing or riding with my friends is they're like, yeah, I'm watching you, and they're like on their phone, and their you know, boots aren't buckled. Well, they're not going to be ready to assist me in a rescue. So take the time to be like, hey, Freddie, you, you ready to go? And he's like, yeah, I got eyes on you. I'm watching you. OK, cool. So just take a couple more minutes and make sure everybody's ready to go into the slope. And they're actually watching you. When Freddie does a little presentation on avalanche rescue, maintaining visual contact is a key thing. And that starts off by being ready at the top all together as a team. So like this is a good picture of it. So people at the top there, 
and then you know watching one at a time to the next big steep slope. So what do you guys think about this? Anybody see you got ski in the middle? People right there, right? Kind of poor travel technique. How many of you guys have seen this here in the walks out? This is pretty common here, right? Yeah. So like if your friends do that, you know like next time just hit them with the pole. <laughs> what are you thinking? All they can do is just like kind of maybe ski off out of the way a little bit more so in case this thing did avalanche. Not everybody would get caught. What do you think of this travel technique? <laughs> nice. Nice. nice travel technique, right? <laughs> go ahead, go home. And then the last thing is, is don't travel in the backcountry by yourself. You guys, go always go out with a partner. How many of you guys have been hurt at a resort? Okay, all right. So I've been hurt, I've been hurt like multiple times. I'm gonna put two hands up. Okay. How many of you guys have been hurt in a resort where ski patrols had to take you out? So just think about that can easily happen in the backcountry. So you always have a partner with you and a cell phone and maybe like a first aid kit. That's a big part of what we're trying to teach here tonight. It's not just outlet awareness, but just backcountry ski too. Okay, so it's kind of all, I, all I've got about trip planning. And before I pass it on to Freddie for rescue, any questions, you guys? Of course. Where should we go ride at? Where should we go ride at? Yeah. Well, I've got my I've got my guide phone number over here. You can email me in guide service now. <laughs> or know wherever you want. This is the first trip on you. What? what this is the first trip on you. This is the first trip on me. I'll let Freddie give the first trip on him. <laughs> he charges 500 euros a day. <laughs> 600 euros a day. Plus a 30 percent tip. Swiss francs, not euros. Oh, Swiss francs. Sorry, Freddie. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm going to pass it on over to Freddie. He's going to talk about rescue here real quick.